DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, presents The Resilient Church, The Glory, The Shame, and The Hope for Tomorrow, with Mike Aquilina. Mike Aquilina is the author or editor of more than 40 books on Catholic history, doctrine, and devotion. Among his many books are The Mass of the Early Christians, The Fathers of the Church, The Mass, The Glory, The Mystery, and The Tradition, co-authored with Cardinal Donald World, and The Resilient Church, The Glory, The Shame, and The Hope for Tomorrow, the book on which this series is based. He has co-hosted with Dr. Scott Hahn, eight series that air on the Eternal Word television network. He has co-led pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. He's a widely sought-after Catholic speaker. The Resilient Church, The Glory, The Shame, and The Hope for Tomorrow with Mike Aquilina. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Mike. It's great to be back, Chris. Thanks for having me. I love the discussion on the history of the church, especially the power that seems to fuel the engine that you've spoken about in previous sessions, driving us down this course in history. And that is the faith of the early church, well, and the faith that we have today. That's right. It is the continuity that we find. It's like this current, this electrical current that runs through history. And the engine of it is God's grace. And through our prayer, it's a remarkable thing. What we find when we study history is that history really isn't just the tracking of the rise and fall of empires, but it's the story of the prayers of common people like you and me and like the people who live next door to us. It's a beautiful thing when we come to realize that and we find it most clearly in the lives of the saints and in the history of the church. In our last discussion, we talked about the martyrs of the church, those who bore witness for the faith to the world. And for them, they were often so misunderstood what it was to be a Christian. Uh, You cite in that first chapter the historian Tacitus, who despised the Christians, probably not as much as he despised Nero, but even his writings and his understandings give us a glimpse of how the world misunderstood what the Christians were doing. And as you point out, if they could believe that Christians were cannibals, it was easy for them to believe that they were arsonists and would That's commit right. bad crimes. And when we look at that, there were Christians who were a little hypersensitive about that, and they cared a little bit too much about what the world thought of the church and of them, really. And they wanted to make a, a faith that was more rational in their mind. And uh, and often what they would do is rationalize the faith away, and they would come up with a, a brighter package that would be attractive to uh, the elites in the Roman Empire, and they would cross over into heresy. What we find is that so many people willfully misunderstood the faith, or you know they did not take admonishment when they had done it accidentally, when they had just kind of strayed into error, when they were corrected by the bishops, they didn't take the correction, and they their pride made them separate from the church and take disciples with them. The history of the early church is uh, kind of pockmarked by this shame, the shame of heresy that arose in so many different places, and sometimes, with alarming success, took away so many souls. I think it is important to bear in mind, and as we enter into this discussion, that this is another example of history. It's not necessarily something that just happened in the past, because it does crop up over and over again. Even to today, we experience these same types of activities within the life of the church. Sure, because who can encompass the mystery of God? Whenever theologians approach the mystery. They have to do so with great humility. And yet, as we know, many theologians are brilliant men, very gifted men and women. And in the ancient church, they approached the mystery, and sometimes they thought they had it nailed. They had it all covered. And so they would put forth these things that were judged later on to be errors by the bishops, but they would not take correction. They were Mm -hmm. so proud, and they had so much of themselves invested in their teaching that they they would not stand corrected, and they would stray in first into schism. Usually, they would they would break from the church, but then into outright heresy. They would just give themselves entirely to their error, and their error came to dominate their thinking and lead to lead to lots of other errors. One of the marks of the great saints is that they were willing to take correction from their superiors, even when they were right. 
Mm-hmm. They acknowledged that there was authority in the church, and they bowed to that authority because they knew that that authority was legitimate. They didn't always admit that they were wrong, because sometimes the saints were persecuted by people within the church, but they recognized the authority within the church, and the heretics tended not to. It's so comforting to know that one of the key character marks of God is that his faithfulness to his people And when he tells us at his ascension that he will send another to be with us, to help lead us and guide us in that gift of the Holy Spirit, that it wasn't just for that one moment that's noted in the Acts of the Apostles, that great Pentecost, but that Holy Spirit would dwell in men and women that would come forward to bear witness and and to help keep us close to the truth that Christ established for us. And and I'm speaking in particular of the work of those first apologists, and and primarily Justin, who came Mm -hmm. forth to help us to be able to stay closer to the truth that Christ gave us. That's true. They came forward with the kind of teaching that was needed in that time. And every age needs to be addressed in a different way. And at that time, what the apologists did was they tried to articulate the faith for a hostile audience, for a sneering audience, for an audience that that looked upon Christians as the new kids on the block, as kind of a fad, a spiritual fad that was, was coming into the world. And the apologists tried to demonstrate the antiquity of the faith, the reasonableness of Christian faith, and they really did play up some things that others looked upon as weaknesses. They would show that Christians were willing to die as martyrs. They were willing to endure the charge of being criminals, and they were willing to do all this for Christ's sake. And the, the apologists knew that that was a strong witness. It was a strong proof, in a sense, of, of Christian faith. Many of the arguments the apologists made continue to be used today when we approach hostile audiences. We draw from the writings of Justin Martyr and of so many others. Justin's witness was, first of all, in his chutzpah for writing a letter to the emperor, telling the emperor what to think about Christians. A lot of the things you're hearing aren't aren't right, and I want to I want to set the record straight. Mm-hmm. He wrote a letter to the Roman Senate. He was willing to go that public in a time of persecution just to get the word out on Christianity, and eventually he was martyred for that. What's what's really cool is that Justin's teaching was so valid then, and it remains so valid now, that when the Catechism of the Catholic Church wanted to talk about the Mass of the Roman Catholic Church, it could think of no better words to use than the description of the Mass used by Justin around 150 A.D., and they used that description verbatim in the Catechism of the Catholic Church published in the 1990s. It, it really, for me, it shows the unity of the faith of the, the 21st century with the faith of the 2nd century, and of course, by extension, back to the time of the apostles, to the 1st century. You ask a question in the book that I think is so important. Why were the Christians so successful? And of course, that's the question, because as we acknowledged in the last episode, Christians were dying all over the place. They were being persecuted. And they were succumbing to all the things that were the great killers of the ancient world, the plagues and the natural disasters and fires. All of these things had no remedy in the ancient world, and they killed so many people. Well, Christians were just as susceptible to those things, and their numbers should have been declining, especially to plagues and natural disasters, just the way the the pagan numbers were declining in the same period and even greater numbers because of the persecutions. But we weren't. We were growing. The sociologist Rodney Stark has has demonstrated that in order to reach the numbers we reached by the 4th century, Christianity had to grow at a rate of 40% per decade. Mm. 40% per decade. Now, if we imagine what our parishes would be like if they grew at 40% per decade, you know, we would be knocking out city blocks just to build our churches all the time. It's a great thing. It's a great image that we have of the early church. And how, how was it spread about? Well, it was spread, up, spread about by the witness of the martyrs. It was spread about by the, the work of the apologists. But I think it was largely spread by the witness of ordinary families in ordinary neighborhoods. They lived Christian life, and that was very attractive to their neighbors. They were happy because they were living in communion with God, and they had peace in their souls. Their conscience was at rest 
And very few people could say that in the ancient world. And whenever we have that, whenever we're, we're witnessing that way, we're putting something forth that's very attractive to non-believers. They want what we have, and they'll, they'll want it more the more they see it. I think for women, this was a tremendous difference because their experience within the marriage is dramatically altered when it was a Christian family. That's true. It's well known that in the in the Roman world, especially women or girls, I should say, were married off by age 11, 12, 13. And they were married to a man, usually, who was not of their choosing. And their consent didn't even matter. Usually their father arranged the marriage. There was not a lot of love in these marriages. And that's attested by the constant references to abuse in marriage, sexual abuse and physical abuse of, of various kinds, of divorce, of abandonment, uh, of the coldness that existed in these homes. Adultery was rampant. Uh, homosexual acts were seen as a kind of recreational activity. All of this, this made life very hard for women in the Roman world. They were also subjected to abortion. The, the standard family was one or two children. You wanted to get a boy. You wanted to get a boy because a boy meant that someone would be there to take care of you if you lived to your old age. Mm -hmm. A boy was an economic asset, whereas a girl was an economic liability. They were called the odious daughter by the comedians of the ancient world. The odious daughter, that was mm -hmm. the standard character in the comedies and the dramas in the theater. So women, women did not have an exalted place. They really didn't have a choice in their mates. And they weren't treated very well within marriage. They were treated first as sexual objects, and then later just as something to produce a son. And then, uh, really, after they had produced a s sons, they were, they were seen as something that had outlived its usefulness. And often they had very lonely lives. It was not a pretty picture. As I said before, abortion was very common in that world. And remember, this is a time before anesthesia and before antisepsis. So abortion was kind of a high-risk thing, and women very often died from the infections that came in the wake of abortion. So it just was not a pretty thing for women then, as it is, as it is now. You know, we, we, we put a happier face on abortion today, but it really does produce similar miseries in women's lives today, and even many of the physical miseries like infertility and infections. So, yes, you're right, it was not a pretty picture for pagan women, but for Christian women, it was different. There's so often on that Sunday when we hear that reading in Masses throughout the world uh, where Paul is teaching us in Ephesians to be submissive to our husbands, and you see women cringing and going, ooh, I don't like that reading. But what's so unique and what's so different is what comes next in that reading about how the man is to treat his wife and to be Christ Great essentially. Husbands, love your wives. Exactly. As Christ loved the church. <laughs> Heroic, self-giving, life-giving love. And, you know, the, the witness of history is that Christians tried to live that way. They really did. They struggled to live that way. And the pagans who, who looked at the Christians marveled at the chastity of Christians. They marveled that Christians could live in marriages without adultery. They marveled that Christians could make happy families. This just was not a common component of social life in the ancient pagan city. And yet, again, this is something that, that many, many ancient pagans witnessed to. Even very prominent philosophers and medical doctors like Galen, they marveled that Christians could even live celibacy through a lifetime. Mm -hmm. They saw this happening and they just could not believe it. It's true. They knew that the Christians had this power and they had a certain happiness that went with it. And it was a, a fantastic witness uh, in the world. I believe that that's what changed the world, that people saw that kind of family life and they saw their own family life and they said, how do I get a piece of that action? How do I become a Christian and, and have the kind of happiness that Christians experience, even though they're ostracized, even though they're persecuted? They're still happy, and their families are happy. They're not cringing in fear. They're loving one another, and their love shows forth in fruitfulness, 
And they don't look upon their children as burdens. They look upon their children as blessings. And the children bring even more happiness as more children come into the world. This is an element of of, uh, Christian family life in the ancient world that was very prominent, that kind of fertility. And it's an element that's still prominent today, that Christian homes are open to life and they're happy about it. Another aspect of the Christian life back in those times that really stands forth is that response to our Lord's call that can be found in the scriptures in Matthew 25 to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to help the poor, to minister to the sick. And that is something in that time, again, was so countercultural in the actions of a Christian. It really was. We keep talking about these terrors of the ancient world. And one of the terrors of the ancient world, the great terrors, was epidemics. You know, you Mm -hmm. think about what what happened um, when an epidemic came into town. Well, medical science was practically non-existent, okay? So there was just nothing they could do. And the first persons to leave town were usually the doctors because they knew what was coming next. They had read the books, and they knew what was about to happen, and they knew there was nothing they could do to stop it. They just had to let it run its course. So the doctors usually left town. The pagan priests usually left town early because they knew what was coming, and they had the money to leave town because the temples were usually banks Mm -hmm. at that time. So the, the, the priests in the temples had money, and they had the means to leave town. Well, pagan families, family members, were, were in, in, encouraged to abandon those who were sick in their homes. Just leave them because they're, the, the disease is communicable. They knew that. They didn't know how it was communicable, but they knew that the best thing to do was to separate yourself, at least at the best thing uh, in terms of protecting yourself from the disease. So they would leave their family members to die there, maybe slowly, maybe quickly, who knows, but they would leave town. Well, Christians knew that they were duty-bound to stay with their family members who were sick. More than that, they saw their family as encompassing all people. So they would care for not only their family members, but their neighbors as well. And what do you think is going to happen if those neighbors survive the illness? They'll become Christian. They're going to be grateful for the life that the Christians gave them. And we know that if you just give comfort care to someone who's sick, if you just give them chicken soup, they stand a much better chance of surviving. That's true today. I'm sure it was true in the ancient world. So Christians had a much better chance of surviving epidemics because they had that comfort care. And the pagans who were cared for by Christians also had a better chance of surviving. We have we have great records of this. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned, Galen before the pagan physician, mm-hmm. and he showed his admiration for what the Christians did in the ancient world. And we also have a letter from Bishop Dionysius the Great of Alexandria from the year 260, when there was a terrible epidemic that really decimated the population of the world. And he's describing what went on. And he says, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. And then he goes on to this beautiful conclusion. He says, Death in this form, the result of great piety and strong faith, seems in every way the equal of martyrdom. So already at this this early early age of the church, we, we find that the overwhelming charity, heroic charity, was honored every bit as much as heroic witness of martyrdom. Through all of this, again, through persecution and everything in the culture that fought against them, as you point out, that steady rate of increase of 40% per decade, it just continued to flourish and grow and grow in spite of all this, would eventually bring us to that time when the empire would begin to embrace and allow Christians to be able to flourish and to worship openly. And that happened, again, in quite a miraculous way because of a vision received by Constantine. 
It did. He, you know, he had the vision at the Milvian Bridge in Rome. He was battling at that time just to retain some control over over the empire. Uh, he was battling against people who didn't want to share the power, who wanted to have all the power. And he, he saw a vision in the sky, and he heard a voice, he said, that said, by this sign you shall conquer. And it was something like the cross in the sky. We don't know whether it was a cross or some similar symbol, but he definitely recognized it as a sign of Christ. And he did conquer by that sign. He, he made his soldiers put that sign on their standards, and they won the battle. So they won the empire. Now, Constantine himself did not accept baptism for many years, but he did consider himself a Christian afterwards, at least a little bit later in his life. And he was given to, um, to the reading of the scriptures and even of a great interest in the church's life. Now, what was it at the beginning that prepared him for that? Was he just recognizing that Christians were the majority and you had to go with this flow or you weren't going to get anywhere because the empire was constantly divided by these power struggles? Mm-hmm. And he probably recognized that, that, that Christians could be, rather than a divisive force, force in the empire, a unifying force simply because there were so many of them. It's likely that in the urban centers at that time, Christians held a clear majority of the people. It's likely that worldwide, they probably held a slight majority, too. So he might have just been recognizing something that already happened. But in any event, we have these things happening very quickly, one, you know, one event after another. There was the persecution of Diocletian, which was the most ruthless and severe persecution of the church, followed almost immediately by the peace of Constantine, which was the toleration of uh, Christianity as a legal religion in the empire. I think, as you put it, the church fathers had given him credit for bringing about the peace of the church. But again, that shouldn't be overemphasized because, as you said, the Holy Spirit was touching the hearts of uh, men and women throughout the land and calling them to himself. That's right. So many people today, you know, you read books like the Da Vinci Code, and they try to say that Constantine practically invented Christianity that he's the guy responsible for the canon of the scriptures, and he's the guy, you know, responsible for church growth. Well, that's that's a lot of baloney. The canon of the scriptures was widely accepted long before Constantine was born. There's ample witness to that. The structures of the church, the existence of the Roman Catholic Church as the standard, as orthodoxy in the world, was in existence from the beginning, and there's ample record of that from long before Constantine was born centuries before Constantine was born. So all of those things just aren't true. Constantine was not responsible for the success of the church. The church has succeeded. He was recognizing that fact because he was a smart guy and because our Lord made it amply clear to him, I believe, in in the vision that he had at Milvian Bridge. But he doesn't get the credit for the success of Christianity. God gets that credit. And so do the martyrs and apologists and all of the other great historical witnesses we've been talking about in these discussions we're having, because there's plenty full record of men and women who were willing to witness with their words and witness with their lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ as we know it today, and they, they did it in an unbroken way down through history in every generation, long before Constantine. Well, that's the brilliance of the resilient church. The glory, the shame, the hope for tomorrow, the work of Mike Aquilina, who we've been talking with today. Mike, any final thoughts? Well, it's it's not so much the work of Mike Aquilina. What I what I <laughs> want to point out in this book is it's the work of everybody. Mm. And that was true in that ancient church. It was the work of anonymous people, the people who were living in the desert, these ancient monks and the, the desert fathers. It was the, the work of ordinary Christians living on city blocks in Rome, these tenements that were so prone to fires. It's just people like you and me that, that changed history. They did it just by fidelity to the word of God, just by living and staying close to the church and raising their families in a godly way. They put forth a witness with their lives that was, as the Bishop Dionysius points out, the equivalent of martyrdom, even if they were not called upon to die as martyrs. It was a powerful witness, and their prayers were the engine of history. The prayers of the saints on earth and the saints in heaven remain the engine of history even today. Beautifully said. Again, I'm Chris McGregor, and we've been talking with Mike Aquilina. Thank you so much, Mike. Until next time. I'm looking forward to it, Chris. You've been listening to The Resilient Church. 
The Glory, the Shame, and the Hope for Tomorrow with Mike Aquilina. To hear and or to download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for The Resilient Church, The Glory, the Shame, and the Hope for Tomorrow with Mike Aquilina.